Thanks to Sana Skin Studio for supporting the No podcast. Sana is a skin studio that is shifting the relationship with your skin and your products through goal-driven facials, real guidance, and clean skincare. Stay tuned for our promo code so you can receive $25 off of your first facial at Sana Skin Studio. Welcome to the No Podcast with me, Nikki Spo. What is up, truth speakers? Welcome back to the No with me, Nikki Spo. Today, I have a fun and exciting interview in store with you. My special guest today is Dr. Nicole Martin. Dr. Nicole Martin is a board certified anesthesiologist and an award winning teacher and lecturer based in Miami, Florida. As a busy mom with a bustling career, Dr. Martin's latest role transports her from the operating room to in front of the camera as the newest cast member of the Real Housewives of Miami. In addition to being certified by the American Board of Anesthesiology and an attending physician at the Lennar Foundation Medical Center, Dr. Martin is a member of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, and the Florida Society of Anesthesiologists. She is also a recognized teacher and lecturer and has co-written several book chapters and numerous scientific articles. In 2021, a new opportunity presented itself to Dr. Martin when she was cast for the Real Housewives franchise filming in Miami. To Nicole, whose whole life was so regimented and calculated, she was open to changing things up and taking a risk in sharing her story. With this new platform, Dr. Martin hopes to provide inspirational career and life advice to other young women. She believes that women are capable of doing anything that they put their hearts and minds to. I'm here for the beauty and the brains, you guys, and Dr. Nicole shows us that they are not mutually exclusive. I am thrilled to have her on the show today, so let's dive right in with Dr. Nicole Martin. Nikki Martin, or is it Dr. Nicole Martin? If oh my you're gosh, it's, it's so funny because everyone who know who knows me from like you know years, they're like, "When did you change your name to Nicole?" Because <laughs> everyone knows me as Nikki. And Same. I was, like, I, <laughs> I was like, "It's always been Nicole," but now it, it, after the show, Dr. Nicole Martin has kind of stuck. Yeah, but, that, but I, I go by all of it. So like, I go through phases where I'm like, like I don't even know who Nicole is for me. Like I've always been Nikki, so. People like on, I remember growing up in the first day of school, people like the teacher would be like, Nicole Sapp. And I'd be like, who's that? <laughs> and like, there's an, there's another Sapp. That's a weird, you know, that's not a very common last name. I'm like, oh, that's me. I'm Nicole. I forgot. I'm Nicole. Because I'm, I've been Nikki for so long. I, same. I grew up in every, I was always Nikki. The only time I would be Nicole is if I was getting in trouble. You know, right. like if I was doing something I wasn't supposed to do and my mom would be like, Nicole. And Anthony calls me Nicole because he says I'm too old to be Nikki. <laughs> You know, it's really funny because like every once in a while now I will be like, what if I, what if I'm Nicole? And I'm like, I just, I don't feel like it. It doesn't feel like who I am. But you know, like when you have that doctor title tacked onto your name, that sounds, that shit is legit. You're like, I'm Dr. Nicole Martin. Okay. It would be weird. Like Dr. Nikki Martin. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't carry as much authority. So yeah, you know, Nicole, it is now. I'm here. I'm here for it. That's, that's pretty pretty badass. So, okay. Well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with me today. I know of you're like super swamped with like work and being a mom and filming and everything. So it's really cool to get the opportunity to chat with you on, on the know. Of course. I'm super excited to be here. Hey. Okay. So your life has been like brought to the national and global forefront with your role on the Real Housewives of Miami. But before we get into that, I know you're a true Miami girl like me. Am I right? Born and raised. Honestly. Yes. I've never even gone like to school anywhere else. I don't think I've ever gone, lived anywhere else for longer than like a week or two on vacation. Like That's where? It. <laughs> oh, on vacation. <laughs> on vacation. It will because some people, they like do the FSU Gainesville thing, right. you know, Miami okay. through and through. Okay. So, okay. Where'd you go to school? Like, tell me, tell me about your upbringing. Like, where'd you go to school? So uh, I went to high school at St. Brendan. Yeah. And then I did all of my advanced education at UM undergrad, med school, residency, fellowship, and then I stayed on board as faculty at UM. So I've been a hurricane, God, since 2001. That's awesome. So I like, I grew up in Kendall and I went like public school the whole way, like legit public school, right? Like even went to FIU. So I did that. I didn't go away for school. I actually wound up living in LA for two years after, after college. So it's a little bit more than a vacation, but it felt like very much vacation because I was just 
like running rampant in West Hollywood. It was bananas, but it was a great time. But I totally, I love the whole like homegrown Miami girl vibe. I mean, I, I get the sense that you're similar to me in that, like you take great pride in being from this, this city. I love Miami. Honestly, I don't think I could live anywhere else other than, you know, a short period of time for vacation. I just yeah, think why is that? Amazing. What do you love the most? You know what? It's the diversity of Miami that I think makes it so special because it's, you really don't even need to leave Miami to feel like you're on vacation. There's like all these different little pockets within the city and it's like a whole different experience, right? You've got like the beach that's beautiful, but then you've got, you know, this whole Wynwood Design District area that's so fun. And then you've got Coral Gables that feels very kind of like antique and old. Like it's just, it's incredible the different feels that you get from the different neighborhoods. Totally. I just think it's so special. So like, what was your home life like when you were growing up here in Miami? That was a little bit more complicated. So um, but my dad was born in Cuba. He left Cuba when he was five, moved to New Jersey. And my mom was from Puerto Rico. She left Puerto Rico when she was 11. And they both met in New Jersey. They were high school sweethearts. And then right after I would, in their 20s, they moved down to Miami. And my dad got into some, you know, typical Miami 80s trouble. Um, and then he ended up going away for seven years when I was a kid. So, you know, he was with me when we were little, I think, how old was I? I always forget this. I feel like I was like maybe 10 ish when he left. And then I stayed with my mom, my brother and I stayed with my mom and my mom kind of just raised us on our own while my dad was away. And so, but they were still married. They were still married. And your brother's littler than you? My brother's older than me. My brother's four years older than me. Okay. And was that hard on you when your dad left? It was really, you know, it was really hard because my mom, like they, like I said, they'd been together since they were 18 and my dad had always been the provider for the family. My mom had never worked a day in her life. And now all of a sudden, you know, he's gone and the bills are coming in, the mortgage, the lawyers, like all, you know, mind you, they seize all your assets. And so now you've got this woman who's in her maybe almost 40 And she's never worked a day in her life, now has to pay all these bills, take care of two kids. She didn't even know where to start. I mean, like, what do you put on a resume when you've never worked or gone to school? Like your name? (laughs) Totally. So it was really hard. Which, by the way, that's changing now, right? Like, I feel like there's this whole movement of people that are, they're like, oh, you were a stay-at-home mom for five years? Put that shit on your resume. As it should be, right? Because I think that that has to be one of the hardest jobs ever. Totally. And and the amount of skills and time management. Right. You know, that you need Resources, to do Resources, like just the way that you think, like being able yeah. to get shit done. The strategy involved in being a stay-at-home mom, it should be on your damn resume. Like Absolutely. it should be. But, but it wasn't then. No. The reality is like when your mom was raising you guys, it was not like a thing. People are like, oh, you don't know anything. No, and my mom was an incredible mom. I mean, my mom was the first one at the pickup line. She was the classroom mom. She was the one that was doing all the art projects. And like, she's an incredible mom, but that doesn't pay the bills. That was really challenging. And I... I My mom, you know, she's very strong and I know that she tried her best for us not to know or notice that she was struggling. But I remember now looking back like little things, you know, like when we would go to the grocery store and her trying to strategize or like, you know, cereal for dinner because it's fun. Let's do breakfast. But it wasn't because it was fun. It was because it was cheap, you know, and um And then she ended up getting a, a decent job like as a property manager for a development and she was there for years. And, you know, whatever, if you figure things out, I got a job, my brother got a job, like we, you know, we had like little things that we would help out with. Where was your first job? I worked at Kumon Learning Centers. Do you know what that is? It's like a tutoring center. I was 14 or 15 and I would tutor little kids in math and reading. Okay, so you were always like super into school then? I was always very academic. I was always very much into school, very much into studying. Um, You know, my dad growing up was very strict. And then I feel like when I saw my mom struggle, I was like, yeah, I need to make sure that I go to school, that I get good grades so that I can become a doctor and I can be successful and I don't have to struggle like my mom did. You know, I was like the opposite. I was like, I don't, I just want to dance and I want to make art and I want to just like be flighty and like this ethereal world. And I didn't really care. I like got good grades because I was... I think I was naturally like curious and like naturally smart, but I didn't really work hard. It was like one of those things I could get by not studying, get B's. You know what I mean? But if I had applied myself, like I would have done well, I would have done better because I feel like I did do well. But like I was very much like in La La Land, like very much in La La Land. Oh, but it's so nice to be able to like 
be in La La Land. When you're a kid, I feel like you should be allowed to be in La La Land, right? Like you shouldn't be worried or consumed with like getting good grades so that you can be successful so that you don't have to eat cereal for like that's like the train of thought that I was like having when I'm like 10 or 12 you know which kind of robs you a little bit of like your youth so then you end up doing dumb things in your 30s like being on reality tv (laughs) no that's not dumb and I can't wait to talk to you about reality tv because I'm so fascinated (laughs) by the whole thing But it's, you know, it's interesting to me because, um, like your life is so much different now, like as far as like, even from just, just like flat out, like a financial standpoint. And like, so I would be remiss to not admit, like, so is mine. You know what I mean? Like my, my situation financially and socially is much, much, much different than how I grew up, you know? And so like, there's like little things where I'm like, I remember sitting with my parents and cutting coupons and like we were going to go to Publix or whatever. And like, I still, it's, it's really interesting because I, there's a fondness about it for me where I like still get the coupon things in the mail. And I'm like, let me just cut these up because it's like, it's like a fond memory. Nostalgic. It's nostalgic. And I actually show my kids, I actually just, you know what, Nicole, I just recorded um, an episode about why you should give your kids an allowance. And I like break down like the whole thing about, cause like, I don't know about your kids, but my kids are like, yeah, mommy, it broke. Just get another one. Yeah. There's a zero just cents another one on like, Amazon. Go just go to CVS. What money is. Right. So yeah. I'm like, you guys need an allowance and you guys are going to start buying your stuff with, with an allowance. But to that I love that it actually. Point, I'm, I'm going to tell you about it. I'm really like, into it. To that point, like I'm like cut coupons. I'm like, look, this is how much things cost. And this is what numbers look like. I mean, they're so little, right? Like our kids are very similar in age, but I'm like, this is what number one looks like. This is what number two. There's like so many teaching things that I'm like, we're going to cut coupons and it's going to be more than just cutting coupons. And whether we need to like use coupons or not, like you're going to know. Yeah, the lessons are there. Right. Exactly. The value of money and like it, it's important. And I don't, and yeah, I think they're still young, but, but they understand a lot. Those little three-year-olds. I know they really, really do. They do. So, okay. So when did your dad come back into the picture? My dad came back. I must've been like 19. Cause I was already. Oh, wow. So you're a grown up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. He left and I was a kid. Right. And then he came back and I was like a grown up. Like I had a serious boyfriend. I was in college. Like I was living, I might have even been living on my own at that point already. So yeah, he came back and um and it's funny enough, the first I knew he was coming out like in a couple days, but I didn't know the exact day because you know my dad was like always very secretive and tries to like surprise you or do things in his own weird fashion. So um, I think the Heat were actually in the playoffs at that point. And I remember being at the Heat game in the Doors Lounge, like with my uh, boyfriend at the time, we are watching the game, and in strolls my dad. That's how I first saw my dad uh, coming to the gym with my brother. Like that was my brother's like gift to him was like, hey, your first day out, I'm going to take you to the Heat game. Oh my gosh. Now, had you maintained a relationship with him like throughout those years? While he was away? Yeah. When he was in Miami the first couple years, he was here in, held here in Miami. We would visit on occasion. But honestly, the process of visiting, I I don't know if you've ever had to visit someone in prison. Um, It's pretty inhumane, to be honest. It's very bizarre. So you, it, it would be downtown. You would wait in a line like two blocks down on the corner. So you're waiting outside in like the scorching heat and it's like you have a time frame at which you can visit. And if you're not one of the first ones during that time frame, you don't get processed in and like you miss the boat. So we'd get there, like say visiting started at 10, you'd get there at eight and wait outside in the heat. And then you'd go in and then, you know, it's like not strip search, but pretty much like, you know, pat you down. And it was just, it was really uncomfortable for my mom and I. And so... I mean, that sounds really like a dick thing to say, right? Like he's in prison and it's uncomfortable for us to stand outside. But I'm a young girl going into this like really just kind of like hostile, not ideal situation. So I would say we visited often in the beginning and then it kind of started tapering off. And then he got moved. He was held in Alabama for a while. And then obviously that became very difficult. So you go your whole upbringing, you decide you're going to go to college. And what made you want to study anesthesiology specifically? So that decision didn't come until later. I always knew I wanted to be a doctor. You know, even when I was a kid, I loved to play doctor. And then I had this most amazing anatomy teacher, Mrs. Adams, who just made 
anatomy and physiology, like the most fascinating thing ever. And I was just so intrigued with how the body works. We dissected a mink and I was just like, oh my God, the organs, like it was just very early on. I knew I wanted to go to medical school. Isn't that amazing how a teacher can change things for you? I mean, it was like, she was so instrumental. I don't even know if Mrs. Adams knows that. And I should probably try to reach out to her and let her know what an impact she made. Um, But she was just such an incredible teacher. So I ended up going to med school and I really wanted to be an OB-GYN. Like I think like childbirth and I still do is just so fascinating, but I hated the clinic part, right? Like the labor and delivery is incredible, but realistically, you don't do that all the time. You maybe do that once or twice a week when you're on call. The rest of the time you're in clinic doing like pap smears and wellness visits. And that wasn't my jam. (laughs) So I rotated through anesthesiology as a, as a med student. And I was like, wow, this is incredible because you're still involved in the labor delivery process, you know, doing the C-sections and doing the epidurals for labor. But there's also so many other different things that you get to do on a day-to-day basis. So I didn't even know I wanted to do anesthesia until I got to med school. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So does it work like, is it, I mean, I, I've never been to med school. So is it like you get to kind of like get a taste of all the things? Yeah. So at least in my med school, your first two years is all clinical. You're like in a classroom, eight hours a day, just learning from textbooks. My, uh, you know, biology, microbio, anatomy, like all the basics. Then your last two years, you're broken up into rotations. So you'll do four weeks of internal medicine. You'll do four weeks of surgery. Um, Then you'll do kind of, you know, cardiology for two weeks, nephrology for two weeks. You kind of rotate through all the subspecialties. And then there's room for electives. So if you think you might want to do dermatology, kind of those weird, you know, like those subspecialties, you can rotate through there. Were you ever like, I don't have money to be a doctor. Like, I don't have money to go to school to be a doctor. Uh, Loans, girl. I I have a lot of them. Well, I had a lot of them. Okay. And I also, like in addition to paying for, you know, med school was like $30,000 a year. So, but you also need to feed yourself, right? You're, you can't work and go to med school. It's just too grueling. So then you take out extra money so that you can live, you know, live. Yeah. Right. Right. So I was very lucky. I went to undergrad on a full ride. So thankfully I didn't have loans from there, but you come out of med school with like $200,000 of student loans. It's insane which is just bonkers to me. I'm listening to you and I'm hearing a lot of like my fears come up in like just hearing your story. I'm like, I wanted to study, for example, I wanted to study, I studied art history in undergrad and I wanted to go to grad school, but I was like, I can't afford to go to grad school. I can't afford to go to grad school. So I didn't go to grad school. I'm like, there's no way, there's no way. I'm like, there's yeah, no way. I mean, it's so, scary, right? Like the yeah, loan scary. Is, is, t- is terrifying, but- I was completely supporting myself. Like I, there, there was like, no, I couldn't see a way for me to support myself and go to school and then like come out, especially like in a profession like art history. Like, what am I really going to do with an art history degree after that? Like, it's not like I'd be yeah. like making money, right? Yeah, that's, that's hard. That's a hard one. Right, right. So, but my question- about that is like, if you're hearing a little girl or not even a little girl, like a a teenager or even like a a student in undergrad. And she's like, I don't know what to do. Like, obviously your situation is different. You took the risk. Like you did not know that there was going to be like a partner in your life down the road that was going to alleviate some of this financial stress down the road. Right. That's not something you knew going in. Right. You don't know that. So what are you telling a girl who's a, a young woman in undergrad, who's like on the fence about whether or not she should go for it. Listen, you go, you go for it, right? There's so many options here. Even if you don't get a, you can apply for scholarship. You can apply for financial aid. Worst case scenario, you take out the loan. All my friends had student loans and you go in, and in, you do like a repayment plan, right? So obviously like when you're a, fe- a, a resident or a fellow, you're not making a ton of money. You're not making a full salary, but you can make like small payments. They can, they strata, they work with you. You know, so that their payments increase as your earning capacity increases so that, you know, your first couple years, you're not making these huge payments, but we've all done it. That's just, it, you know, you, you figure out a way. It's par for the course. It's par for the course. And, and you won't be the first one to take out the student loans. Trust me. Right, right. And, you know, I, I paid back my student loans for many years before Anthony graciously took that off of my plate. That's amazing. So, okay. Yeah. So how did becoming a mom change your trajectory, if at all? Like, were you still in school? Had you already started working by the time you had your son, Grayson? Oh, I was, I mean, I, I had Grayson three years ago. I've been an attending or, you know, out of residency for eight years. Um, 
I didn't want to have kids during residency, during medical school, during any of that time. It's just, it's too challenging. Honestly, you're studying for eight, 12 hours a day. I, I don't know how I people- I can't even imagine that. Like my brain- People did it. Did it. <laughs> people did it, you know? Um, but I just, I know how I am and I just, I like to commit myself to something and I just didn't think I would be able to be successful if I had had kids earlier on. So I chose to kind of put kids on the back burner. But you know what? I think being a mom makes me a much better physician and being a physician makes me a much better mom. I love to hear that. Because honestly, like I value my time in each role so much more knowing now that it's kind of limited, right? Yeah. Because I know I'm not a stay at home mom and I don't necessarily have eight hours a day with Grayson, when I pick him up from school or I get him at three, four, five o'clock, I know that I only have a finite amount of time with him. I really try to make the best and the most out of that time. So at five o'clock, we'll go to the museum and we'll be at the museum for two hours, you know? I and I, I feel like I appreciate it so much more and I'm really present when I'm there. Totally. Because I do both roles and the same at work. Like I'm, work is not a drag for me. I enjoy going to work. I enjoy taking care of patients, I guess, because I'm not doing it all the time. Yeah. I did reduce my my workload to four days a week after Grayson was born. I mean, that makes sense. And it's nice to have that, like the opportunity to do that, the option. Yeah. I I went four days a week because there's always those like little things at school that you want to be able to go to, you know, they're having like a Mother's Day activity or a little performance. So I went down to four days and I'm happy there. For me, it's perfect. This conversation is so good, but before we keep going, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsors, Sana Skin Studio. The best way for me to describe Sana is that it feels like coming home. Unlike traditional facials, Sana's facials are rooted in education, and I love this so much. Every experience I've had at Sana has been a chance to learn more about my skin and its needs. I love that the facials are effective while also being accessible enough to be a monthly ritual rather than a yearly splurge. I'm honored to be able to provide our audience with a promo code. Use the code the no glow for $25 off of your first facial at Sana when booking via sanaskinstudio.com. And so what were your thoughts then when the Real Housewives of Miami approached you and like who approached you? How did that go down? Oh my goodness. So this is like very funny. Um, I have a very good friend. Uh, She's, let's call it like a celebrity therapist. If you've ever watched Billions, Wendy Rhodes, that's kind of her. She's got these very high profile clients and they approached her to be on the show. And she was like, look, I don't think it's a fit for me. I don't think my clients would appreciate me being in like the public eye and being unavailable. But I have a friend that's similar personality, similar vibe to me. I'm going to put you in contact. So I started talking to some of the producers and the casting company. And I was like, this is weird. You know, like I, reality TV, like I've never done anything like this. And I would talk to Anthony about it. And he was like, maybe it'll be fun. And I thought, you know what? Maybe it will be fun. I feel like my life has always been so structured, you know, like med school, studying, take a test, yeah, take yeah. your boards, do this. This is like the first time in my life where I felt like I was in a place to do something spontaneous and something kind of off the beaten path. So I just kept doing the interview process and they, at the end, they were like, would you like to be on the show? And I was like, okay. I- That's so fun. So, okay. So this, you know, what is really stands, what really stands out to me about that is like, you say you didn't have, like, you were not spontaneous before, right? Like a lot of people go through their lives and their spontaneous years are in like their early twenties, their teenagers, early twenties, right? They're going through that. Like, it's very rare to have something fun pop up like later on in life, especially after you have kids. Like, and I hear people all the time that like one of like, okay, this is like a really random example, but like people, I hear all the time that people who have like their, their baby, they're like, yeah, we don't want to know the gender, the sex of the baby because there are not any pleasant surprises in adulthood. There are very few. Uh, so like, let's have this pleasant surprise pop up. I mean, I'm, I'm such a control freak. I want to know the sex of the baby, but like to your point that like, there's not a lot of fun surprises that come up like later on in life. I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe like that's a poor attitude to have about it, but in general, like the surprises that come up are like usually harder things to deal with, right? Like things that are stressful. So to your point that like this opportunity came up and you're like, this could be fun. This could be spontaneous. And your partner, because that was my next question is like, how did Anthony respond to it? Right. Because 
I mean, if I were to say, say this to my husband, he'd be like, absolutely not. Like, no, like Eric is notoriously private, right? Like, I think it's really cool to be in, like, it's interesting to me to have a, to have an opportunity to be like, this could be super freaking fun. He's the type of person that he's very comfortable taking risks, which is why I think he's so successful. He's like, you know, you don't grow if you stay in your comfort zone. He's like, you really have to push yourself. He's like, take risks if you want to do something great or you want to challenge yourself. And I remember when we first started dating, I had the same job that I had when I first came out of residency. And it was a great job. I was comfortable and I got an opportunity for a new job, the job I'm currently at. And I was so scared to make the leap because I was like, no, I'm comfortable here. I don't know what this is, right? And he's like, yeah, but this can be great. And it, he pushed me to take my new job. And thank God, because my new job is amazing. I still love my old job, but this one's even better. And it's he's really the one that pushes me outside of my comfort zone. And I'm thankful for that because sometimes awesome. you need that like little nudge, you know? Especially if you can do that for each other, you know? Well, he like needs no nudging. <laughs> he does not he need to be nudged. nudged. <laughs> he's, like, <obviously. laughs> he's like, let's reel you back, honey. That's so funny. That's so funny. So, so, um, what made you then like, what was the determining factor of like, yes, I'm going to do this. So I'm like an oddly, I don't think people know this about me, but a very kind of like spiritual person. Um, my favorite book is Gabby Bernstein's the universe has your back. And I'm kind of just like, you know what? I didn't go looking for this. There's tons of people that were auditioning for it that really wanted to be on the show. And it kind of fell on my lap. And I would go through the interview process with a very much like, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. If it doesn't happen, who cares? Like my life is great. You know, I, it's not something I need. And it just like, it kept working out. It kept working out. And I was like, you know what? There has to be a reason for this. Like this was put on my plate for a reason. And like, who am I to deny the universe? You know, like, let's just roll with it and see, see where it goes. I still don't know the reason I ended up on the show. Maybe it was for personal growth. Um, cause that's definitely been something that's happened for sure as a result of the process. But I, I was just like, it happened for a reason and let's roll with it. And do you feel like it has disrupted your life at all or enhanced or both? I mean, um, I think it both in different ways. Yeah. So when we film, we film for like three and a half months straight. Those three and a half months are exhausting cause I'm still working at the hospital I still have Anthony. I still have Grayson. Like you still have your family life. And then you're adding this other thing that now takes up curricular. Yeah. A (laughs) lot of time. And it's not just the time that you're filming. It's like the time it takes to get ready. So I'll work until three, four o'clock. I'll get home, sit down, start doing my glam hair, makeup, whatever. And then I'm somewhere at seven filming till 1030. And then by the time you get home, I cannot. You take a shower, you go to sleep, it's midnight, and then you got to work the next day again, right? It's a lot. And mom, like you're going to go to work and like take care of like who needs to bring a snack today and who's like needs extra clothes at school. It's it's a lot. And, you know, um, I feel guilty during those three months that I'm maybe not as present as I am normally. Um, But I have the most amazing girl, Grace, that does my hair and makeup and Grace and my son loves her. So he'll sit on my lap and we'll like play games while she's like working around him doing my makeup. And, you know, we make it work, but it's exhausting. You know, what's really beautiful to me is that like your son gets to see you go and be this like badass doctor and anesthesiologist and also be this like powerful, beautiful, glamorous woman. You know what I mean? Like they don't have to be separated. I think that like we grew up in a time where it's like, you know, in the nineties and two thousands, you had like women being objectified, like left and right, right. Everything was sex sells. And then I talk about this a lot is like the pendulum swung and we were like, no women, we're not beautiful. We're just smart. We're capable. We're just like guys, right? Like we can do everything that men can do, which is so true. Like we totally can, but they can coexist like a, a woman can doesn't have to be one thing or the other. And I think you're in a really unique position to show your son that, like you specifically because of what you do in the workforce, but also what you're doing as far as like you're into fashion and beauty and fitness and personal health and growth and all of these things. And you're really getting to demonstrate to a young boy that women are truly multifaceted. You know, a lot of people will ask like, God, why do you still work? 
Like, you know, like, you know, you, you have a, a partner that can take care of things. You have a great life. Like, why are you still going to work? And I mean, one, I love what I do. It, I don't consider it work, right? Like I'm passionate about taking care of patients and, and, and being an anesthesiologist. But I also think it's so important that Grayson see a woman, his mom, his a, a partner, right? Like a wife who has their own career path, who's driven to like do something. I think it's such an important example to set for him. And I want him to eventually find a partner that is passionate about something, you know, of their own and that like is motivated to go do something. I just think it's so important that he see that. But, you know, I think also as a woman, like I think he, it's important to do your own thing. He, you know, you never know life changes in the blink of an eye. Something could happen to Anthony, you know, relationships fail at times. And like, you never know what's going to happen. And you always, I feel like need to be able to stand on your own two feet. And I just, I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it up for anyone. I think that's really, really important. I feel like, um, just even on my side of the street, like I remember when Eric and I, um, came out as a couple, like people, I was a teacher and people would ask me like, why do you still work? You know, or why are you doing whatever? I loved being a teacher, you know? And then for a period of time, I did do the whole stay at mom thing. And that was de- like that, that was detrimental to my health. Like I lost myself. I wasn't okay with it. And I'm not knocking, like, I love being a mom, but I'm like, I need to have something, especially like going back to like this whole ethereal creativity part of me, of what makes me, my, my makeup it's like I really needed to have something outside of the home to stimulate my creativity and like really just feed into who I am as a human being. And so I totally get that. And like having gone from like, yes, having my own thing to not having my own thing and then coming back into a space where I get to do what I love again, it's it's so, so important. And it sounds like you've it's something that you've really been in touch with for a very long time. Yeah. And and like I said, I really do think that having your own thing, you know, having your identity makes you a better mom. Like, like, don't you think like when you're out of the house and now you come back, you're like excited to see your boys, you want to catch up with them versus when you're home all day, you're a little annoyed, right? Like you hear them and they're like, you're on, you're on a short few. 100%. Totally. uh, For me, when people are like, oh, how do you do it? Or why do you do it? I just think it makes me a much better, well-rounded doctor, mom, partner to have my own space and my own identity and something that is undeniably mine. So did you ever feel like while you're filming, did you ever feel like overly exposed or overly vulnerable, like threatened in any capacity, not threatened by any people specifically? That's not what what I'm asking, but just like, holy shit, like my whole life, like this is very open for me. Um, Yeah, totally. I mean, it's, it's, it's even something so stupid, like you know, we, I remember one day we were filming a scene at, at, at a park, Anthony and I and Grayson, we were doing like a family day. We had gone to the park and I had brought one of those like little razor scooters, you know, like the ones that they push on to the park for him to kind of play in the park. And I forgot his helmet. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, the trolls are going to kill me. I'm at a park. My kids are riding on a scooter. Like with no helmet, with no helmet. I'm a, a doctor. doctor. I'm a doctor. I'm supposed to make better decisions. And I swear I didn't sleep for like three days thinking about the trolls and thinking about the people. And oh my God, people are going to say I'm a bad parent. And I should, it was like little things like that where you feel like people are going to just judge you or, or dissect what you're doing. But you know what? I was just like, the scene came, the scene went, it went on TV and not a single person commented about the stupid helmet, but you, you, you get lost in this worry about what is this going to look like? What are people going to think? And at the end of the day, like, I just, I can't live like that. You know, I'm just like, I have to just be true to who I am. And you know what, what mom hasn't gone to the park and forgot the damn helmet. Totally. You know, like, it's just like, I'm human. It is what it is. And like, I'm not going to be anything other than myself out of fear. And so how do you like tame that? Because I'm sure that like, especially with social media, like there are people who say whatever, whatever, like maybe not specifically about the helmet, but like other things. I am a huge advocate for therapy. So I definitely like have someone that I check in with just because like you get lost in your thoughts or things bother you. And you kind of just want to like, I think of her like as a life coach, bounce ideas off of that are totally neutral. And I also, I hired a girl to kind of help me with my social media and I don't want to deal with the trolls. So she will go through my messages, delete anything. Like she doesn't respond for me, but she's like troll police. 
because you know what? I don't want any of that negative energy in my space. I don't want to see it. I don't want to be bothered by it. It was funny. I was listening to a podcast and the, the hostess said that your social media is like your house, right? And you wouldn't let someone come into your house with muddy boots and stick their dirty feet on top of your white couch, right? You would be like, yeah, no, get out of my house. Your social media should be the same, right? It is yours. It is your special place. And if anyone wants to come in with their dirty, muddy shoes, you are not welcome. So I kind of just try to put distance between it. You know, it's so funny that you say that because like I've, I feel like I've developed a very strict like policy on how people feel, talk, push their beliefs about sports onto my page. Oh my gosh. Like the harassment that happens sometimes, like if we lose a game or whatever. Really? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I've like really been intentional about like, we, you do not come here for this. Like I don't go to your home this like about your wife sucks. Like, I don't, I would never, like, I would never be like your dad, whatever your mom. No, like you, this does not happen on page, but it, it still happens. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like one of those things that I can't relate to it on a global scale, the way that you might be able to from, from being on a sh- on reality TV, but in the same vein, I'm like, Oh my gosh, where people like, they're so passionate about sports and they have so many opinions and their backseat coaches. And they're like, yeah, they can coach the team. I'm like, imagine. I'm like, okay. I'm like, all right, this just isn't welcome here. So it's just block and delete and block and delete. Yeah. Keep well, I will out. happily share Kiki's phone number with you in case you <laughs> don't want to deal with it. She's amazing. Kiki, what's uh, up, Kiki? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I am very blessed that I have actually surrounded myself with an amazing team. Um, you know, the girl that does my glam grace has become like a very dear friend and also like a therapist at times and Kiki. And it's just, it really helps to make this world that can be a very toxic at times um, place a much happier and, you know, peaceful. Easy. Yeah. Easy. I was reading a book. I'm going to, I'll send you a copy. It's by Susie Moore and it's called Let It Be Easy. I love Susie, by the way. You know Susie. Yeah. So Grace, my glam girl introduced me to Susie and she's just, I, I was like, you emit like glitter. Like she's just this nice, like amazing, like positive person. And I just, we need more Susies in the world. Absolutely. So she was a guest on on the show. So I'm going to forward you her episode so you can listen to it because you'll get a kick out of it. She's just amazing. And so I'm glad that you know her because like to know her is to love her and she's just such a real sunshine. But I'm all about it. Like I'm all about of sim- all about simplifying my life at this point. Like it's got to be easy and it's got to feel good. And obviously not everything is going to feel good all the time. Of course. Like how do we set us- ourselves up for success? I want to ask you about like how you feel about your the exposure of your son. Cause that's like a big thing. It was definitely something Anthony and I, you know, went back and forth and we actually got a lot of, I don't want to say negative, but pushback from the family, right? Like, you know, he's so small. Are you putting him in danger? You know, because people get really crazy. Like, I understand, you know, like what if somebody takes him or like wants to hold him for rants? Like people got in the family got really in their feelings about it. And it definitely, you know, made me think twice or three times about it. But I think if I have chosen, right, to to share my life, the good, the bad, or all of it, there is no sharing me without sharing him, right? Like he's such a crucial, integral part of me and my story and who I am. I just, it's, it was either go all in or not go at all, right? And I think especially for women being an advocate for being a working mom and doing your own thing, like I have to be able to share that you are a my, mother, that my mother, yeah, like being a mother with people. And I try to be very cautious about the things I share, right? Like I try to never take him anywhere with like his school uniform on. It sounds so crazy, but I always have a change of clothes in the trunk so that if we're going to the museum or somewhere after I take off his shirt so that there's no like identifiable logo just so that people don't go to, you know, like don't go to his school or weird things like that. Um, I try to, you know, I don't post pictures, you know, inappropriate pictures of him. Like I don't like bathtub pictures of kids to me. I think that's kind of like more private, you know, but I, I just, there's no way to do it right without like sharing a little part of him. Well, that's a real, very real part of your life. Yeah. And so how do you feel lastly, how do you feel like you are able to use your platform to inspire young girls? 
you know what I love is the the woman in medicine, professional woman side of things. So many times people will reach out to me and be like, how did you do it? How are you still working mom? And I want to show young girls and women with kids that you can do it all. You can manage to, you know, be a mom, go to school, still be cool, right? Because when you're a kid or you're in college, sometimes studying isn't cool and you want to go out and you want to party, but you know what? You can be the pretty girl and go to go to school and study. Like there's a way to do it all. You just have to be willing to do it. I think we all get stuck in our fears and we don't do things because we're scared. Just do it. Just go. I'm so excited that I had the opportunity to talk to you, (laughs) Dr. Nicole Martin. This has been such an amazing conversation. I'm I'm honored to have you as a guest. I'm I'm grateful that like our both of our mutual audiences get to like get a a deeper insight of who you are and what makes you so special and unique. Because you know, I think at the end of the day, I mean, I don't know anything personally about reality TV, but you're at the it's my understanding that you're kind of at the um at the whim of whatever they're, what they want the script to be, right? To an extent. I mean, you know, the, the interactions are all genuine, right? Like you, the way the scenes are all genuine, but you're kind of at a whim of what's happening in other people's lives, right? Yeah. Like if someone's hosting a particular event and you're invited to, you kind of have to go and that's what's going to be shot. It's going to be shot. Um, so in that sense, yes, there is like a, a, a story, so to speak, that you're following with your fellow castmates. Um, but all the interactions and the conversations and how you handle situations, that's all authentic. It's weird. It's like a balance of, you know, like telling a story and being true to who you are. Well, I'm grateful to have the opportunity for people to get to know you even further. You have a very good understanding of who you are as an individual and you love yourself, which is the ultimate, yeah. like, that's the ultimate bag, right? For sure. There's no way to be in this world if you're not very confident and strong in who you are because you just get like kind of lost in the shuffle. Well, thank you, Nicole, for being such a light. Thanks, Nikki. Good luck with the baby. Thank you. (laughs) This podcast was brought to you by Sana Skin Studio. Be sure to use my code, the no glow for $25 off of your first facial at Sana when booking via sanaskinstudio.com. More than a skin studio, Sana is a movement towards healthier skin and self-love. Thank you so much for listening to The No. If you loved this episode, go ahead and share it with a friend. Words are so powerful and someone may need to hear what we covered today. And if you really loved this episode, please take a moment to rate the show and leave a review. Your comments are so important and valued, and they give other listeners insight on what to expect on The Know. You can connect with me personally via Instagram at Nikki Sap Spo and The Know with Nikki Spo. My hope for you today is that you are fearless in looking inward so that you can be your highest, most authentic self and go after the life of your dreams.